we nominated several candidates, uh, Christine O'Donnell, Sharon Engel, Todd Akin, Richard Murdoch. Uh, they're not in the Senate. And the reason for that was that they were not able to appeal to a broader electorate in the general election. Uh, my, my goal is the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate is to keep us in the majority. Uh, the way you do that is not complicated. You have to nominate people who can actually win because winners make policy and losers go home. We changed the business model in 2014. We nominated people who could win everywhere. We took the majority in the Senate. We had one skirmish in 2016. We kept the majority in the Senate. So our operating approach will be to support our incumbents and in open seats to seek to help nominate people who can actually win in November. That's my approach. That's the way you, that's the way you keep a governing majority. Mr. President, sir, Mr. President. Welcome back to the program. There has been a feud that has been brewing for quite some time now. And it is something that I would say started in about 2010 and has moved forward from there. And that is the disconnect between regular America, uh, Joe, Joe Sixpack, whatever you want to call us, uh, the folks that are not in Washington, and the Washington elitist Republicans, the establishment. There is us versus them. And no bigger person to uh, convey that difference was former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon, since he is no longer at the White House, has made it a mission of his to destroy Mitch McConnell and the establishment Republicans who blocked at every opportunity his ability to help make America great again. President Trump was elected to make America great again on a populist nationalist theme and policies. And he has been stalled by the elitist Republicrats and globalists in Republican leadership. So now you have a Bannon versus McConnell fight that has been brewing now for quite some time, certainly since he has left the White House. And you have President Trump smack dab in the middle of this, trying to mediate the two of them. Now, I have nicknamed Mitch McConnell the Kentucky Fried Chicken back in 2013 for many reasons. Number one, he's from Kentucky. Number two, he is a chicken and has been afraid to um, go against Barack Obama because he bought the line that anything that you do against Barack Obama, you're automatically going to be painted as a racist. Well, he bought that line, uh, hook and sinker, and therefore now finds himself in a constitutional crisis in which President Trump, unfortunately now, has been acting and has to act like Barack Obama had to act, which is, again, to get things done through executive action. We've seen what he's done lately with Obamacare and getting rid of uh, the ability to not be able to sell it over state lines. He's now released that, and I believe there's more coming. He's going to do more to dismantle Obamacare. We saw what he did with the TPP. We're seeing what he's doing right now with NAFTA. Um, we're seeing the Iran deal. We're seeing the Paris Accords. So Barack Obama's horrific eight-year destructive legacy is coming to an end. It's taking a lot more time. It could have been a lot faster if people like Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan actually allowed him to govern the way the voters wanted him to. So that's why I nicknamed him. And I nicknamed him that because of silly comments, like he said in 2014, when he said, we will, quote, crush the Tea Party. And then recently, he said that we will support those candidates who are incumbents, regardless of who their challengers are. Now, Mitch McConnell is a huge, let me repeat that, a huge reason why President Trump's Make America Great Again agenda has stalled in Congress. He is one of the main culprits and reasons, of course, with John McCain and Jeff Flake and Lindsey Graham and Lisa Murkowski and Rob Portman and uh, many of the others. Uh, I think I said John McCain and some of the others. But ultimately, it is, man it is the upper management, it is the upper leadership, if you will, in the Senate and the House that dictates policy 
and they have fallen. They have decided that they would rather be in the minority, possibly in 2018, than to have the responsibility of governing and or the fact that they hate the president so much that they're willing to sacrifice not only his agenda and his policies, but also their own power just to make sure that he is not successful. That is very, very evil, and it is very, very sick. And it is exactly what I have said is happening since the very inception of his White House. Now, along with Paul Ryanoceros, uh, and the reason I've called him that is because he's the biggest rhino in the House, and he is the Speaker of the House, uh, the Republican leadership is weak, ineffective, feckless, and adversarial. Now, his comments uh, about how upstart outsiders and populist challengers can't win is not entirely true. And that's why I started this segment with that video, because I wanted you to hear from Mitch McConnell himself how stupid, how idiotic, how imbecile he actually sounds, because he does. He's trying to say that anyone that challenges an incumbent is crazy. Anyone that challenges an incumbent can't win. Well, I got news for you. He did mention a few people that lost. And for every Sharon Engel and um, uh, Todd Akin and Richard Murdoch and Christine O'Donnell, there's a Ted Cruz, a Rand Paul, a Mike Lee, a Deborah Fisher, and so on and so on. Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Mike Lee, and Deb Fisher, by the way, all took out entrenched establishment incumbents or beltway blue chippers that were hand-picked by the Republican leadership. Let's not forget that. So again, uh, McConnell is not completely correct. Yes, there have been some candidates that, uh, that won their primaries and then lost in the general election. But there's also been those candidates that have actually won their primaries and won in the general election. And I just named a few right there. So one of the worst moves, and I'll say this until I'm blue in the face, one of the worst moves that President Trump has ever done was to ask Steve Bannon to leave his White House as chief strategist. I think that was a terrible, terrible move. I think that it removed a large populist nationalist figure that was going to be in one ear while he's listening to the globalists and Jared Kushner and uh, Gary Cohn and, uh, and Ivanka Trump, his, his, his daughter, and many others in the other ear. And Steve Bannon was that nationalist populist that was helping guide President Trump's agenda to make America great again. Now, Bannon, again, has made it a personal mission to go after Mitch McConnell and any candidate that the establishment supports. Uh, he was emboldened by his victory over Luther Strange with Judge Roy Moore. Judge Roy Moore was certainly the better candidate for Alabama, and thankfully the voters in Alabama recognized that as well. Uh, but I think what's going to happen is that Bannon is going to look to find candidates, hopefully they'll be well vetted, and he's going to recruit candidates that are outsiders, that are populist nationalists, that believe in President Trump, that believe in a Make America Great Again agenda, and not establishment figures and globalist figures and Washington elitists and insiders. And I think what he's doing now is he's raising money, he's working on creating super PACs, and he's helping to find candidates that will replace uh, Corker's Tennessee seat and, of course, Jeff Flake's Arizona seat and, of course, many others. Now, is Bannon's strategy the right strategy? Uh, is it going to help or hurt in the long run? Uh, I think that that is a fundamental question. The answer is more than likely it will help more than it will hurt. Okay, And it's really going to depend on who he decides and the alt-right and the populist nationalists out there decide who to actually target. Now, I don't think it's smart to spend money and resources trying to remove Roger Wicker in Mississippi, Deb Fisher in Nebraska, 
Thad Cochran in Mississippi or many of these others that are all basically establishment figures, but they're in Mississippi, they're in Tennessee, they're in Nebraska. They're basically, for the most part, in pretty red states. And so I don't think that that's smart to remove those folks, even though those folks that I mentioned are complete establishment type rhinos. I think he would be better served to go after Jeff Flake in Arizona, go after Dan Heller in, uh, in Nevada, and then go out and support candidates that are defending their seats. So in other words, Democrats that are defending their seats uh, in the swing states, I think it would be best if Steve Bannon helped out and found candidates to run and try to find candidates that can win in states, not just like Arizona, where I think uh, Kelly Ward can beat Jeff Flake. I will certainly be voting for anyone but Jeff Flake uh, as long as he is not going to be the nominee uh, there in the Senate. But getting rid of Flake would obviously be good because, again, Arizona is a purpling state and uh, it would keep the state red a lot longer. But again, McConnell is correct in one thing, that having and keeping a majority is typically better than being in the minority. However, he has not governed as though he wants to be in the majority, and I think that that is the main reason that Steve Bannon has been so emboldened to go after him and his candidate. However, what good is it to remain in the majority if you're going to govern as if you're in the minority? Think about it. They have allowed the minority party, the Democrats, to basically dictate the flow and what's going on in Washington. Why? Because you have people like Jeff Flake and John McCain and Lindsey Graham and Lisa Murkowski and Rob Portman and Susan Collins and many others that have fought President Trump instead of helped him. That's one of the main reasons. So having a majority like we have now, what good is it doing us? It's not doing us any good at all. So Bannon would be wise to concentrate his efforts on finding viable candidates, completely vetted candidates, to challenge John Tester in, in Montana, to challenge Sherrod Brown in Ohio, to challenge Bill Nelson in Florida, and Claire McCaskill in Missouri. If we take over those seats with good candidates, vetted candidates that are populist nationalists that support President Trump and what he's trying to accomplish for America, then his agenda after 2018 will be a lot easier to get done. We won't be fighting once, twice, three, four times trying to pass Obamacare because we'll have a bigger majority and we'll have people that will support President Trump's agenda to make America great again. So let the establishment and Mitch McConnell spend their money on attacking Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts, on uh, Thomas Carper in Delaware, on uh, Kirsten uh, Gillibrand in New York, Chris Murray in Connecticut, Bob Menendez in New Jersey, and other Northeast Republicans. We should not be spending any money on those types of races. Let the establishment and Mitch McConnell blow the money on finding candidates that are you know, Democrat light, because that's all you're ever going to find from a Northeast Republican. You're never going to find a strong, strong Republican, although I would say President Trump is the exception to that. So let them spend the resources and money trying to find people to fight against and to take some of those seats where we take the collective efforts, money and resources, and put it into the states that are the swing states in which we can win those seats, where we have a better opportunity to win those seats, and to make the majority in the Senate much larger. I always say this, always support the candidate that fits your goals, your policies, and your ideology the most. However, if your candidate does not win, support the one that does. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, Josh, that's completely different from what you said in the first half of this video. Not necessarily. I do not like Jeff Flake. I do not like uh, Dan Heller. I do not like any of those folks. But if they win their primaries, if they become the, the person that's going to run up against the Democrats, guess what? I'd rather have them back, unfortunately, in the Senate 
than to have more Democrats in the Senate. It's really that simple. I can't stand Jeff Flake. I don't like his attitude. I don't like how nasty he's been against President Trump. But if you're asking me, would I rather have Jeff Flake to vote for or, or the communist Kirsten Sinema or even worse, the care representative and lawyer Deidre Abood? Yeah, I'd be voting for Jeff Flake. I'd be lining up for Jeff Flake. I'd do everything I could to get Jeff Flake elected. But obviously in the primary, I will support anyone but Jeff Flake because I do not want to see him continue in the Senate. Same thing with people in Nevada, another swing state, Dan Heller. Let's hope that they find someone to run against him. Let's hope that they find other people in other areas to run against some of these incumbents that are weak establishment uh, incumbents and or weak Democrats like Tester, McCaskill, and many others. Because the bottom line is when we stay home, the Democrats win. And when the Democrats win, everybody loses, not just the Republicans. We'll be right back. George Orwell once said, during times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. I am a truth seeker and a truth teller. And for that, I am now a target. What do you get for exposing the American Red Cross and their donation practices? How about a target on your back? What do you get for exposing the real hate group, the Southern Poverty Law Center? How about the left reporting your videos to Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube? And what do you get for exposing the litigation practices, harmful associations, and suspect marketing tactics of the Susan G. Komen Foundation? How about complete censorship, threats of litigation, and demonetization of my videos? Telling the truth in the year 2017 and in the future can be a dangerous thing, but I will continue to do just that. And as I've said many times before in the past, I would rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Do you believe in censorship? Do you want to see my voice silenced? I sure hope not. And if you don't want to see my voice silenced, then I need you to support my show. Please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Josh Bernstein and support the show financially. Your small monthly contribution or even one-time contribution will help me continue to put out future exposés that the rest of the media would not dare touch. Please do not let George Orwell's warning come true. I appreciate your support. Hi, I'm TV talk show host and national spokesman Josh Bernstein. The state of Florida deserves to be led by smart and competent people. That's why here at The Josh Bernstein Show, we are proudly supporting Bruce Nathan for governor. Bruce is a strong and principled conservative who will bring states' rights and constitutional values back to Tallahassee. Some of Bruce's solutions for Florida include ending Common Core in Florida, ending all sanctuary cities, ending federal taxation, and ending human trafficking. The state of Florida will no doubt be once again a vital component to President Trump's re-election chances. That's why it is imperative that the governor of Florida be a huge supporter of our president. Please go to BruceNathan2018.com and help make Florida great again by donating to his campaign today. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein, TV talk show host and national spokesman for the Association of Mature American Citizens, or AMAC for short. AMAC is the conservative alternative to groups out there like an AARP. We have all the same types of products and services for folks 50 years of age or older. 